Okay, uh, we're gonna just get into topic seven today and uh, run up the bat of the demo here in a moment. Uh, and I'll get to that in a moment here. And uh, just trying to figure out how to do it with the people remotely. I have a video as well. Um, but let me just, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. So topic seven, topic eight, topic nine and topic 10. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about culturing microbes. Uh, how to diagnose and um, identify them, and uh, we're also going to talk about uh, how to kill them. So topics uh, nine and ten are about sterilization, disinfection, and uh, antibiotics. And um, it's only four topics, but uh, actually we're going to cover quite a quite a bit of content. And, and believe it or not, that's going to be what we're going to cover for midterm number two. So I know everyone's just trying to forget midterm number one. <laughs> Um, so midterm term number two is uh, basically four weeks from now. Uh, I'm not can't remember the exact date, but take a look at your calendars, and uh, just so you know, it'll it'll cover topics seven to ten. Okay. Uh, topic seven is on microbial culturing. So we're going to talk a little bit about the biology of these things, how we can grow them, and uh, things like that. And uh, so let's talk about um, some of the things that you might be learning in. Uh, some of your other nursing classes eventually. One of the big things is, of course, somebody is sick and uh, it's like, what is wrong with this person? So uh, a sample is collected. So maybe they have, uh, they think they have strep throat. So one of those swabs goes down to the back of the throat and the tonsils get, uh, get swabbed and, and eventually that's gonna go to a test. Um, if you've had a COVID test, uh, um, <laughs> the, the nasal pharyngeal test is extremely pleasant. <laughs> Anyone have that one? You know, it's like they're sticking it in your nose and they're, they're like trying to hit you in the back of the brain. Um, yeah, so those are fun. Uh, but there's all sorts of different types of specimen collection uh, methods, depending on the types of bodily fluid and all that. And these are things that uh, we're not really going to talk about here because this is not really my area of expertise in terms of how to do these things. Um, but uh, you get an idea. We're looking at different fluids and these are where the microbes might be hiding out. And then the next step is, of course, figuring out what do we have, right? Um, and that's what we want to talk about in this class. So I have a demo here. Um, I think the problem is I'm just trying to figure out how to how to do this because uh, I'm just worried about there being echo. If I hook up these speakers for you guys, then it's going to echo. So I think what I'm going to do is play the demo, and I'll talk and tell you what's going on. Uh, this was a demo I actually made last year because everything was online, and. Uh, uh, at the end of class, uh, if we have time, I actually have some extra plates and whatnot, and we can swab a few things. And uh, if anyone has something they'd like me to swab, I have a whole bunch of plates. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So let's just play the video and I'll, I'll explain what's going on. Okay, so what I have here is a stack of agar plates. So you can see what they are. It's basically a Petri dish, and uh, inside is some agar media. I also have some cotton... Uh, swabs. I'll open that in a moment and I have some uh, saline solution here. So what I'm going to do is swab a few things. So the first thing I will swab is the palm of my hand. So you can see here's the, uh, the swab I have. I'm going to get it wet with the saline solution. I'm going to swab the palm of my hand, see if I can get some bacteria off of it, and then I'm going to smear it across the petri dish, the agar. There we go, put that aside, label the plate, so I can label that as hand. There we go. Now I'm going to swab a couple other things. So the second thing I have to swab here is a dish sponge. So this one here, I probably, it's already wet, I don't need a little bit of saline solution, I'm just going to squish it. There we go. Smear across the agar. And there's the second one. So this is the sponge is a used toothbrush. So here we go. Let's see if we can get in there.
my son's toes. So let's see what we can get in there. Probably some Staphylococcus. And the last thing, I'm going to swab this laptop. So just in between the keys, trying to get in there from the nooks and cranny where all the dust is. Now I'm done the swabbing, I have the plates all packaged up and I'm going to put them in this incubator here. And you can see the incubator, I have it programmed for 30 degrees Celsius. I'm going to put my plates in the incubator and we'll leave them there for a day or two. And hopefully we'll get some nice colonies that grow up on the plates and we can take a look at them in class. So I uh, usually I do, uh, um, I'll do the demo for everyone. And, and like I said, if we have some time at the end of this, we can do some swabbing. Usually what I do, I walk into class and there's usually somebody in one of the front rows wearing sandals. And I'm looking for toes, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I can usually get some volunteers to do some hands or uh, keyboards or sometimes cell phones or things like that. I actually have these great, um, well, they were great, <laughs> these giant Petri dishes. Um, I'm trying to remember, I think I got them about six or seven years ago. And um, this is back when people had smaller cell phones, <laughs> right? And so you could take a whole cell phone and actually put an imprint on here and you get some pretty cool images. Um, nobody has small cell phones anymore. They don't fit on these things. And unfortunately, when you buy these boxes, you get like, uh, you know, 500 of them. <laughs> so uh, I usually try to find something, um, maybe a little calculator or something like that to, uh, uh, to put on large petri dishes. So at the end of this, uh, you know, maybe I'll find some people from the class and we can try swabbing a few things. I, you know, I don't want to do anybody's like, you know, internal noses or anything like that. But, uh, you know, I mean, I think there was somebody a couple years ago who had a, you know, belly button uh, ring or something they wanted swabbed or, or uh, you know, between the toes is good, palm of the hands, uh, personal objects, you know, uh, those kind of things. Um, sometimes really smooth things. Uh, you're, not, you're not necessarily going to find a lot of bacteria on the, uh, you know, if this was your cell phone, for example. Uh, you know, in this part, I might find something, right? But it's usually generally smooth. And so sometimes it's a little better to, you know, kind of get in the cracks or around buttons where there might be a little bit of dust that's going to harbor a little bit more bacteria and whatnot. Uh, but the principle is pretty similar in terms of swabbing uh, an individual who is ill. Like I said, you know, you're going for the tonsils, if it's a, if it's a throat um, uh, infection, uh, or, uh, you know, like I said, that nasal pharyngeal one where they're, they're trying to go back where they believe the virus is, is going to be found, although my understanding is that there's a lot of recent studies to show that it's not necessary going that far in, um, but it's kind of still now, still the standard practice for, for it. And, um, you know, it could be a, a, a pussy infection or, or whatever, right? And, uh, you know, sometimes the, um, the swab might go into a, a tube of media or a, a Ziploc bag or whatever. It really just kind of depends on what it is that they think they're looking for. Uh, and there's, there's different protocols. Like I said, this one's easy to do, um, you know, and I can, we can grow up and see what we can, what we can find. So I'll show you some of the results. Uh, this is from last year. This is uh, what I did last year. Uh, like I said, everything was online. And uh, so I was mostly looking for objects around the house. Uh, usually I look for objects either, you know, students have or, you know, I'll do the doorknobs and the, the computer and whatnot. But uh, you can see there's, um, there's some growth on these plates. And if you look at them, um, some of them, uh, well, the sponge one grew up really thickly. It's really hard to tell what's going on in terms of the species. And, and when you have the actual plate in front of you, it is a lot easier to tell what is going on in terms of the colors. Uh, a lot of them end up being kind of, uh, how shall I describe it, a creamish color. <laughs> um, many bacteria grow in those colors. Uh, with slight differences, if you look at the toothbrush one, right, there's um, these larger colonies here, and there's certainly a little bit more brown and yellow than these main ones, which are kind of whitish. And uh, if you look at the hand, uh, you, have a lot of, you have a lot of white colors. Uh, so I can't remember what I found on the toothbrush and the sponge, but the hand, I'm looking at this and I'm telling you that most of that, 99% of that is Staphylococcus, right? And I know that because I know what Staphylococcus looks like, and that's what's found on our skin. And uh, so what I want to do is kind of connect this to next week's lecture where we're going to talk about gram stains and uh, show you the gram stains of some of these samples 
and how that can be used to identify what's going on here. I have a couple other uh, plates I'll show you. So here's the toes. That's again, mostly staphylococcus. Um, I can tell from the white color and, and I think that one I did do a gram stain on. Uh, there's the keyboard. Uh, keyboard, usually we find some staphylococcus, sometimes we find some E. coli and uh, a couple of other things. And then one more, I didn't show you, but I did a hand. And uh, that one turned out really nice. Um, fathers don't wash their hands as much as they should. <laughs> and actually some of these fuzzy things here are um, probably some sort of mold, right? Mold, of course, turns out kind of fuzzy. So anyway, yeah, we'll come back and kind of connect this to, to some of what we're talking about. I want to talk about, you know, what is this in general? What is agar? And uh, some other uses for it as well. Let me see. Somebody has a chat. Oh yeah, somebody's laughing at the uh, the pause on hand. If you can get them to hold still, right? <laughs> uh, so sample collection is uh, part of this. And uh, like I said, that's probably going to be your job. You know, when you graduate. Uh, and uh, identification. Um, sometimes that's done in the clinic. There are some rapid tests that. Uh, you know, take five minutes and things like that. And um, sometimes the things have to go through a laboratory uh, for a technician to look at. Uh, and sometimes that test takes hours. Sometimes it takes 24, 48 hours. It really just depends on the kind of test. And we'll talk about some of those. So some of these tests are uh, culture dependent. That means you actually have to grow the organism and then you can figure out what it is, right? So maybe you grow it and you do a gram stain or you grow it and there's some sort of colorimetric test or something. And that's kind of what we want to talk a little bit about today. Uh, some methods are not dependent on growth. What's going on here? Let's try that again. Um, it kind of just depends on the specimen, right? So you probably know that the, um, uh, the COVID-19 test, uh, the main one that they stick at the, the back of your nose, um, that's actually a DNA-based test. Or sorry, not DNA. It's, it's RNA virus, so it's a, I guess we call it a nucleic acid-based test. Um, so you, you don't need to culture the virus for that. Thankfully, <laughs> we don't need to be culturing coronaviruses in every you know, diagnostic lab in the, uh, on the planet right now. Um, but there are other tests, right? These microscopic tests that uh, may or may not require culture and uh, there's serological tests and things like that, which we're gonna get back to uh, next week. So that's kind of mostly topic eight. So there we go, yeah, there's the breakdown. Topic seven, topic eight. So we're going to talk a lot about growing bacteria because uh, that's kind of one of the main things that's done in these diagnostic labs. Uh, like I said, you're rarely growing viruses. You're using other tests for growing viruses. We'll talk a little bit about growing viruses as well. And uh, other organisms, fungal organisms, uh, the growth principles are very similar. Protists, uh, some of them we can't grow. Uh, some of them we can. Uh, they're kind of a mixed bag. And uh, most of the tests are not culture dependent. They're things like blood smears and things like that. On, on microscope slide. Um, so the, the nice thing about bacteria, at least most of them, is they grow very quickly, right? So uh, I can't remember what year. I remember I had strep throat. And um, for strep throat, by the way, there is a rapid test. And um, so, so the funny thing is, I'm like, pretty sure I have strep throat, right? Um, it's got kind of those spots. I don't know if anyone knows what strep throat looks like, but look up some pictures of these little red spots in the back of your throat. And, and it just like it just hurts. You know, you can't swallow anything, right? Uh, except for ice cream, which is not a bad thing. Um, but I'm like, okay, it's it's back there and it's kind of on the right side of my throat, right? And and then the um, the nurse is like, okay, well, let's take a swab. And then she swabs the left side of my throat. And I'm like, what are you doing? Anyway, the rapid test came back negative, but the rapid tests are only maybe 90, 95% accurate. So that means like one in 10 or one in 20 people, you're going to get a, a false negative. So as a follow-up, they do the overnight test. And that's where they actually, you know, take a second swab and it goes in a tube. And then that goes to um, a lab. And uh, probably what they do is just spread it on a plate or put some media growth in a test tube. And, uh, and then they do gram stain, right? So a lot of these organisms, you can see they, they multiply very quickly. E. coli, for example, 20 minutes under the best conditions. Uh, most labs, it's like 30 minutes. But that means that overnight, 
So 12, 16, 24 hours, you can get a decent culture very, very quickly. Uh, some of these other organisms are very slow. Tuberculosis is famously very slow. Uh, so somebody has tuberculosis, um, usually you're not depending on a culture because now you're looking at something, if you, if you take a look, right? Rather than maybe 24 hours, now we're looking at maybe 24 days. Right? We, want, we want to treat someone quicker than that. Uh, you can see this one here. This is the one that causes leprosy. Microbacterium leprae causes leprosy and, and so on. So there's different, different growth plans. Kind of depends on the organism. But most of them, most of the um, medically relevant ones do actually grow relatively quickly. Well, I guess I have this today. I don't need to go back to the computer every time. Uh, so what do we need to grow these things? Um, Usually we need to know a little bit about their biology and you can sort of break this down into different uh, kind of parameters, right? I sort of have them broken down into physical requirements for growth and chemical requirements. So these are, um, I got some slides on each of these, so I'll just sort of talk about what they are, right? So um, hold on a second here, there we go. Just fixing my, my computer mouse here. So let's talk about temperature. You probably know that um, human body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. And uh, so no surprise that most of our pathogens are pretty happy at 37 degrees. Some of them kind of like a little warmer, some of them kind of like a little cooler. Uh, but that's generally when we grow things, uh, we're growing them at 30 degrees. You may have noticed in my demo, I actually was growing things at 30 degrees. And um, I'm doing that because uh, I actually know from experience, I usually get a little bit more variety of organs from environmental organisms if I grow it at 30 degrees. Uh, and that's just, you know, a little bit of experience for that one there. Um, but uh, you can see this is showing kind of a minimum, a maximum. Most organisms are not going to grow above 50 degrees unless there's some sort of a weird organism that's living in, in a hot spring or something like that, which we're not really caring about uh, for medical purposes. So typically, like I said, 37 degrees, 35 degrees, 30 degrees, depending on what you're trying to culture, uh, those are pretty typical things. Um, so, uh, biologists kind of group these into different categories, and uh, so the ones we're thinking about in terms of um, uh, medically relevant organisms fall into the group that is called mesophiles. You don't know what file means? What if I said something was hydrophilic? I don't know what that means. They like it, yeah. So hydrophilic is something that likes water, soil and water, right? hydrophobic, scared of water, right? So in this case, mesophilic, it kind of means they like medium and it doesn't say what. So it should be thermal mesophilic, should be the full word. But it means they like a medium kind of uh, a moderate temperature, right? You can see a thermophile is something that likes heat. And uh, so not as important medically, but there are some thermophiles that are important for um, uh, food quality because uh, uh, food, of course, you know, uh, for example, canned food is often cooked before putting in the can, and some of these thermophiles might survive and cause food spoilage. So we do care, care about those a little bit. You can see we have a sacrophiles. I don't really know what sacro means. Probably means something to do with cold, um, because these are things that like cold conditions. So those are like soil organisms and whatnot. So the mesophiles are the ones we care about. Uh, I have a, a little table here. You can see uh, here's some common uh, human pathogens, and you can actually see, you know, Staphylococcus, tuberculosis, they like 37 degrees Celsius. E. coli likes 40 degrees Celsius. So what's going on with that? Well, it's very easy for us to think that humans are the most important things on the planet. Um, and maybe we are, maybe we aren't, doesn't really matter, but we're not the only things on the planet. And E. coli actually lives in the gut of uh, all sorts of warm-blooded organisms, so that includes birds. And birds have uh, body temperatures that are typically higher in the 40s, so 42 degrees and things like that. So E. coli has found that happy medium because it wants it, it likes to live in mammals, it likes to live in birds. So it actually most often only grows at 40 degrees. Uh, you can see um, Mycobacterium leprae, that causes leprosy, uh, likes a lower temperature. So I'm guessing nobody here has ever seen leprosy. I've only seen photos myself, but anyone know where it affects? What body system? Yeah, exactly. And if you look at photos, um, people with leprosy 
Um, it's often the fingertips, the nose. So it's, it's, it's on the body surface and places that tend to be a little more cool is where it's happiest. Um, and, and obviously that's very debilitating and terrible to have. Uh, so it doesn't live internally. And um, it's, it's clinical pathogenesis reflects that. Uh, leprosy, by the way, uh, is also found. Um, we know it's found in, in two or three places in, on the planet in terms of its natural reservoirs. Humans are one. Uh, and the other thing that it's found in the wild is, is armadillos. And it lives in their foot pads, uh, and which is also cooler temperature. So just a tip, right? You know, if you're somebody who picks up roadkill for whatever reason, uh, don't uh, you know, handle armadillos with, uh, with gloves. <laughs> um, you, you may laugh, but I, I know a lot of biologists. And, and believe it or not, like I, I've known a few of them. They have that hobby. Right? Um, they find a dead animal and uh, they're like, oh, that would make a beautiful skeleton for my collection. <laughs> right? And, and so they, you know, they have ways of preparing it and, and all that. And, and, and it, is a, it is a thing, right? Uh, believe it or not. Um, this one here, I don't know if we talked about this organism, treponema. That causes syphilis. So here we have a sexually transmitted infection. And um, this organism, is, uh, is infecting the genitals. And the genitals are, you know, they're not internal 37 degrees. They're a little, you know, a little bit cooler, a little more external. So it's awful temperature is actually 34 degrees. So a lot of these things, um, you know, their, their pathogenesis does reflect their optimal temperatures, I guess, areas where they've adapted to or whatever. Um, one more I want to talk about is listeria. And I don't think we've talked about listeria yet, um, but notice it's happiest at 30 degrees Celsius. So listeria is, um, is an organism that is uh, really serious and taken very seriously with food safety. And uh, I'll show you uh, some examples here in a moment. Uh, so here's an example of, um, this was a pretty significant outbreak of listeria. This is a year on there, 2011. And uh, it was uh, a very deadly outbreak of this, uh, of this bacterium. And what does it say? Uh, 123 persons became ill and 25 people died. Um, I mean, the numbers aren't huge, but for a food outbreak, this is very significant, right? Um, particularly in, this is the United States, but uh, uh, United States in terms of food safety is, is like Canada. Uh, we have very, very, very stringent um, uh, controls, right? Uh, we're talking about when there's a food break in cantaloupes, uh, you can't buy them anywhere suddenly. They're taken off the shelves immediately, uh, anywhere that may even remotely be connected with the supplier. And uh, that happened, uh, what was that, two years ago? We had a, an outbreak. Uh, there was a food recall on romaine lettuce. Anyone remember that? I like Caesar salads, and suddenly you couldn't find romaine lettuce for like a month, right? And uh, so we, we have very strict things going on. So what is listeria? Listeria is a, is a gram-negative organism. Uh, kind of looks like E. coli, and, uh, and is spread through uh, fecal matter, and uh, can be spread associated with all sorts of uh, food outbreaks. So why is listeria so significant? Um, it grows well at warmer temperatures, so it could grow well in your body, but it's one of these um, unique organisms that actually grows well at cooler temperatures as well. So it has a very broad range. So it can go from like body temperature all the way down to, unfortunately, refrigeration temperature. So a lot of, you know, this is why we have fridges, right? We put our food in the fridge, and uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep longer because at cooler temperatures, most of these organisms don't grow very well. They might grow very slowly. Listeria, on the other hand, um, can grow a little faster. And so, you know, people have their salad in the fridge that, you know, contaminated, uh, uh, let's say, Brussels sprouts or, um, you know, mushrooms or whatever. Listeria can get on all of these things. And, uh, and so it becomes a risk. And it's also associated with, uh, it sometimes it gets on lunch meats. So there's been all sorts of recalls every year. I usually try to look up some listeria recalls. And every year, it's something totally different. Uh, last year, it was um, um, not Brussels sprouts, but uh, I don't know if they're just called sprouts. You guys know what I'm talking about? The little, yes, yes. Those are the ones I'm thinking of. Yeah, green bean sprouts and um, some sort of um, pre-made macaroni dinner. Like basically, it was some pre-made craft dinner. It wasn't craft, but some other brand that you could buy. Uh, and you can, you can look these up. 
Uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency has all these recalls all the time. You can look them up. Usually it's like a certain brand and a certain lot. So this one here, for example, uh, some sort of smoked salmon. And uh, you can look up and uh, I think actually in the recall I actually said, you know, uh, the 500 gram um, package, not the one kilogram package or something like that, right? Uh, here's another one, some sort of uh, what is that? some sort of mushroom, and uh, and usually it'll tell you where, right? It'll say this recall is is relevant for Manitoba and Saskatchewan, right? And uh, anyway, like I said, it's always interesting to see because listeria can end up in everything, and um, it's very serious. I guess I didn't tell you about how serious it is, right? Listeria is is um, uh, can be very serious for anybody who uh, is uh, somewhat immunocompromised. So if you are an infant. If you are old, um, it's one of these organisms that is uh, a danger for pregnant women that can uh, affect the fetus, uh, uh, and uh, it causes uh, all sorts of symptoms, uh, fever and chills and things like that, uh, and it can affect all sorts of body systems. So if it gets in the blood, it's, it's obviously more serious than if it gets uh, in, other, in other body parts. Um, but uh, you, you can look it up. Uh, kind of the big message is that it is uh, associated with food recalls and can grow very well at a, at a variety of temperatures, which is kind of unique. All right, so just let me see if I can get rid of that uh, couple of, I don't know, there's a couple of questions here. Yeah, somebody's talking about that being common on alfalfa. And uh, yeah, I mean, the list of foods is huge for listeria infections. All right, so temperature is important. Like I said, most of these organisms, it's kind of body-ish temperature, right? Uh, that, that they're gonna be grown in, in the lab. Uh, so what about something like pH? Uh, this is something important uh, for technicians, you know, who are making media and uh, most organisms, uh, if you're looking at bacterial organisms, most of them sort of enjoy uh, a neutral pH. Um, so pH is how acidic or alkaline something is. And so neutral pH is seven and uh, you don't, understand how the pH scale works, you can look it up or you can talk to me later, but seven is a neutral pH. So it means it's not acidic or not alkaline. Uh, fungal organisms seem to enjoy a little bit more of an acidic environment. And I'm not sure exactly why that is. Maybe it has something to do with what's going on in the soil and whatnot. But uh, so you can see there's kind of a range there. And so you can actually use this, I thought I had a slide here. Uh, but I do wanna talk about one organism that likes uh, being in an acidic environment, so it's an acidophile, and I know I have, there we go, I knew I had an animation. There it is. Did you see that? That was fun. It took me a while to figure out how to do that, <laughs> but there it is. <laughs> so that is Helicobacter pylori. So let's talk about this guy. Um, this one here, here's an image. Uh, it, um, it's kind of got a little bit of a bended rod, sort of twisty rod look to it, and it has multiple flagella. And then this one here um, loves living in an acidic environment, and therefore it can live in your stomach. There are a lot of organisms that will go through your stomach, but they won't live there naturally, whereas Helicobacter will. And so this has been an interesting organism because we've had a lot of uh, uh, information over it that's come out over the years. You can see maybe my note there, it says uh, it's associated with gastric ulcers and, uh, and uh, in some cases, uh, some stomach cancers. Um, there's kind of an interesting story about uh, Helicobacter, because if you go back and you still hear this today, where people have ulcers and often people say, oh, it must be stress or something like that, right? And uh, um, certainly there are things that can exasperate ulcers, uh, such as choice of diet and whatnot, but they're not caused by stress, even though people still think this. This goes back all the way uh, we figured this out in the 1980s. Um, actually, it was an Australian scientist who was associated, he was looking at ulcers and he kept finding this bacteria. And remember Koch's postulates, right? Koch was finding um, a certain organism involved with a certain pathogenesis, right? So Koch tested his hypothesis in mice, right? And the scientist was trying to do this kind of thing, but this is uh, an organism that uh, is associated with human disease. And so how do you do that? So he tested himself. <laughs> right? He, he drank a flask of Helicobacter, got some nasty ulcers, and then treated them with antibiotics. Because there are a lot of people that said, no, this is not a bacterial infection, this is stress and whatnot. And uh, so since then, um, uh, treatment of these things ha has been um, 
uh, re revolutionized, obviously, because now we know acids aren't the treatment, um, antibiotics are. So there's, there's some controversy around this because it turns out there are different strains of helicobacter. So by the way, about half of us have this, by the way, right? So, you know, I don't know how many people in this room, but probably 20 of us have this in our gut right now. And probably 20 of us do not have gastric ulcers. So it turns out there's different strains of this thing. Some of these strains actually seem to protect against ulcers and stomach cancers. And some seem to exasperate them and cause them. So initially when this was discovered, the thought was, okay, let's just wipe them all out and anyone who has these things. And so lots of people were getting treated. Now you don't necessarily get treated uh, because they're trying to figure out, you know, are you at risk or not? So if you have ulcers, uh, it might be you have the wrong strain um, and, and you can get treatment for it. Okay, so next one is uh, osmotic pressure. What does that mean? It means how much salt is there, right? So uh, you may know um, a lot of people, uh, you know, historically, and people still do it in order to treat meat. What do you do? You, you put salt on it. You're basically making beef jerky, right? Uh, and what does that do? The salt is, is put onto the cells and uh, water uh, um, migrates towards the salt um, through osmosis. And, um, and when you take the water out of cells, um, the cells don't grow. And by cells, I really mean the bacteria that are on the meat. So meat that has been treated with salt can actually last a long time. Um, and uh, so, you know, you've probably talked in high school about, you know, all those isotonic and hypertonic and all that. I don't really want to get into all that, but this is, this is what it means by osmotic pressure. And, and so what's the relevance of this? The relevance of this is that some organisms um, need and thrive in a lot of salt. And so when they're being grown in a lab, uh, this is kind of the thing to do, right? So if you take a look at this, um, you can see I have this, uh, this is Petri dish here, right? And uh, it's, it's made in, into three zones. And most bacteria in the top zone are not growing under a high salt condition. This is 7.5% sodium chloride. That's a lot of salt, right? So if you think of like a glass of water, that's like taking two tablespoons of water or of salt and putting it in there. Uh, you know, it's very, very salty water. Uh, you can see we have Staphylococcus epidermidis on the left. It is growing. Um, it, it actually looks a lot nicer on my um, on my computer screen. I know on the uh, projection, it's maybe it's a little hazy, but it is growing there. And then on the right is Staphylococcus aureus, and they have uh, I'm not sure what's in there, some sort of color adds indicator to distinguish between the two different types of Staphylococcus. But Staphylococcus where does it grow? On your skin, right? And your skin is actually kind of salty. You know, we sweat um, quite frequently. And so this organism is well adapted to live in there. And uh, so there it is growing with lots of salt. Okay, so um, I don't know if there's some, I know there's some chat there of some sort. Somebody says, is that why they get you to gurgle with salt water when you have a sore throat? Uh, yeah, actually, very good question. Uh, yeah, and um, a lot of organisms can't tolerate that. So you can actually uh, inhibit a lot of organisms in your throat by gargling with salt water. Uh, plus, it makes your throat feel better, right? I used to be a skeptic because I just ate salt water. <laughs> Finally, I tried it once, and uh, it actually made, it has a bit of a soothing effect. So what else do we need to grow these things? We need food and chemicals. So I, I know I have a big long list here. I'm going to kind of blast through it. And what I want to do is get to talk about some specific types of uh, food and nutrients we're giving these organisms. Um, so for example, you can see we have carbon. Hi. Oh, <laughs> yep. There's a question. OK, no question. OK. Uh, fair enough. I guess let me just unmute their microphone for a second. Um, so carbon is um, maybe the obvious one, right? And, and most of the food we eat, right? You think about we eat carbohydrates, we eat fats, we eat proteins. Um, a big part of that is carbon. So that's what we're talking about. It's kind of the big part of their diet. And carbon is used to make all of the macromolecules, proteins and phospholipids and, you know, everything else in a cell is, is usually carbon-based. So this is important. And, and usually it's an energy source for many organisms. Uh, nitrogen is important for amino acids and nucleic acids. Sulfur is important for certain amino acids. Phosphorus is important for DNA and RNA. Uh, so I don't want you to get caught up in this list. Like I said, I'm going to blast it relatively quickly. What I want to do is get to some certain media types. But all these things are taken into consideration by scientists 
when they're formulating uh, recipes for growing these different organisms. Uh, some organisms require uh, other things, usually in small amounts, things like organic um, growth factors. Uh, that includes things like vitamins. So small um, doses of these chemicals that are essential for things like enzymes and whatnot. Uh, trace elements that usually we're talking about, uh, you know, things like iron and, and uh, copper and zinc and, and metals like that, which are often important for various enzymes as well. And oxygen. Oxygen is very important for us because if you don't have it, we die. <laughs> uh, and it's true with a lot of organisms as well. Uh, we're kind of, um, there's, there's different ways to classify organisms in terms of their oxygen needs. And uh, so you can see I have three categories here. So we fall into the category here on the left, which is an obligate aerobe, right? So you probably know aerobic means oxygen, right? Uh, obligate means obligated, right? So you must have oxygen. So what you're seeing here, this is just a little cartoon, but it's showing um, this test that can be done. And what it is is a special type of media where it's oxygen rich at the top and no oxygen at the bottom, and it, it goes through a gradient. So you can see the one in the middle is a facultative uh, anaerobe, sometimes called a facultative aerobe. And that means oxygen, great, no oxygen, just fine, right? It'll grow with or without oxygen. So E. coli falls into that category. It likes oxygen, it thrives in oxygen, but it will grow without oxygen, just slower. Uh, and there are a lot of organisms that fit in that category. And it makes sense, right? You could imagine E. coli growing on my Petri dish here. And, uh, you know, this is exposed to the air and there's lots of oxygen. And so it's happy and it's growing very fast. But, you know, E. coli in your intestine is competing for oxygen with uh, billions of other organisms. And um, so it's a scarce resource. So it can still grow without oxygen. You see the last category are obligate air, uh, aerobes. And uh, what I... Uh, what I meant to, to show you, actually, I have a, a thing I was going to show you, and maybe I can draw a little picture of it on the, on the screen here. Uh, I think there's a, there used to be a pen here somewhere. Let's see if it works. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about how we grow um, anaerobes here. And I was going to show you, I have a, let's see this, ah, uh, this pen's not working. So. I'll try to explain it. <laughs> um, so anaerobes are, are the biggest challenge for, for culturing. And uh, there are a number of clinically relevant uh, anaerobes. I'll show you one of them here. And uh, I know this is a bit of a horrifying picture. Um, this is a clostridium organism. And a lot of these clostridium organisms are anaerobes, meaning they don't need oxygen and actually can't even grow in the presence of oxygen. This is the one that causes uh, gas gangrene. And uh, you can see it's, um, it's, it's a horrible infection. So what it does is actually, it actually gets under the tissues and forms an anaerobic uh, environment um, where it can, it can grow and thrive. Uh, so I was going to show you um, some different ways we can, we can culture anaerobic organisms. And, and the way I was going to show you uh, is uh, something I have in my office that I found here when I, when I uh, first came to the college. And uh, nobody was using it, so now it's in my office because it's kind of cool. Uh, it's something called a bell jar. So you can picture a bell right, is a big round shaped object. And uh, the way uh, the bell jars work, and I, I, I have colleagues that have used them and they work very effectively. So basically the way it works is you've got this giant jar and you've got a base and you put your culture in the base. So maybe your stack of Petri dishes and you put a little bit of Vaseline or some sort of uh, vacuum grease around the edge of the base. And then um, the, the jar goes on top. And oh, I guess the last thing I forgot to mention is you put a little candle in there. And you light the candle and then you seal it up. So what does the candle do? Uh, yes, and it consumes the oxygen. So it's it's a really cheap, um, low tech system, and it works very effectively. Uh, I had a colleague who worked on Neisseria gonorrhea for about a year, and that was how he cultured it all the time. Uh, worked really well for him. Um, we do have fancier methods, the bell jar classic method. Uh, in our biology lab, we have this thing on the left, it's called a gas pack. And um, it's, it's basically a big jar again with a, um, uh, you know, the lid is, is uh, you know, it has gaskets and whatnot, so you can seal it tight. And um, there's a couple of different ways you can use the, the gas jar. What we do is we actually hook up a, a nitrogen tank and, uh, and flush nitrogen through there and it pushes all the oxygen out. But you can also buy these gas packs 
which are these little, um, I don't even know what's in them. They're just chemicals in a pack. You, you rip it open and whatever's in there, it sucks up the oxygen out of the, uh, um, out of the jar and uh, over a few minutes. Uh, so lots of different methods uh, for this. Uh, you may have seen on movies sometimes, uh, often it's a biohazard kind of thing with the gloves, uh, but, but the same idea, you can have a, a larger um, basically environment. So usually it's a big box and uh, they can um, uh, flush out the box with nitrogen is usually pretty common and then work on their cultures, you know, using these gloves that go into the box and, and, and manipulating all the tools. So lots of different ways to, to do that. Uh, most people don't have the glove boxes. Uh, I've seen glove boxes. Uh, I don't know anyone who ever used one because most people were just doing things in small, um, small quantities. Okay, let's talk about growing these things in the lab. So one thing just to say about growing these things is that um, in the wild, in nature, um, a lot of organisms grow in biofilms. So if you remember way back, we we're talking about biofilms topic, I don't know, whatever that was, topic three or whatever. Um, and, I, and, and we're trying to define a biofilm. And I think one of the things I told you was that if you ever gone swimming in a lake and you, you put your foot on a, a slimy rock, that's a biofilm. So biofilm is kind of like a mat of microbes. And uh, so it includes the microbes and all sorts of secretions that they've spit out. And uh, usually you're, what you're talking about is a community of, of microorganisms. So uh, right now, all of us have biofilms of bacteria on our teeth. And depending on how recently you brushed, it's thicker or thinner. Um, and um, you know, if you went under there and you know, on the microscope, you, you see several layers of these things, right? And uh, like I said, it's communities. And in, in labs, we don't usually grow things in communities. In fact, usually we want pure cultures, right? I want to know that I'm working with what I think I'm working with, and I don't want all the complications of those other organisms. So I want to talk about pure cultures for a minute or two. And um, so one way to grow things is just classic ways in a test tube, right? And like I said, I want to talk about some different recipes and things like that. And there's, there's literally hundreds of recipes of broths, we call them, to grow up microorganisms. Uh, some of them have great names. Um, I found this one, Terrific Broth. It's a pretty common broth. It has a great name. Um, kind of sounds like people who are trying to, you know, pump up their recipe, right? You know, you give someone your chocolate chip recipe. You don't just call it, you know, you know, Blaine's chocolate chip recipe. You call it the absolute best chocolate chip recipe, right? You're trying to you're trying to sell it. Um, but uh, it's it's pretty basic. It has tryptone and yeast extract. So what does that mean? Tryptone is, is a protein source, and uh, yeast extract basically means is they've, they've taken some yeast and they've treated them somehow. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how they're treated, either enzymatically or chemically. And what you're doing is breaking those yeast cells open, and all the goodies come out. So think about a yeast cell is just a cell, and it has nucleotides, ribosomes, fatty acids, and so um, and, and other nutrients, right? So it's just kind of a, a complex mix where they're just trying to think, okay, let's just make something that's very rich in protein and other stuff, and uh, it will grow a variety of organisms. You can see there's some test tubes there. Uh, you can see they're labeled. We've got the one, the third one says E. coli, Bacillus cereus. Not familiar with that one there. I don't know why that one's blank, but there's just a nice picture of some test tubes. And they usually grow up, and they kind of look, you know, they were cream color on the plate, and they end up with different kind of cream or brown colors in the test tube, usually. Oh, some are kind of cool. I used to work with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and it was green and sometimes purple. And that was exciting to get something purple. So uh, let's talk about solid media. So solid media is usually done on a, uh, a Petri dish. So this is a Petri dish here, um, named after a guy, Julius Petri. He actually worked with Robert Koch and invented the Petri dish, so it was named after him. Uh, you can call it a, a plate as well, um, but usually people call them petri dishes, or sometimes people might call this an agar plate. So what is agar? So agar is actually a carbohydrate that comes from seaweed. And so there's some seaweed, and what they do is they collect the seaweed. I'm not sure what kind of seaweed they collect. And uh, then they extract the agar, and uh, you know, in the lab we buy it. It comes in a, in a, in a package, and um, it kind of looks like this. Uh, Maybe you can't see from the slide, but it actually has a little bit of a yellowish tinge to it, which is why most of the agar has a yellowish tinge to it. Um, that looks like actually a really purified uh, version of it. So it's just kind of like making jello. Uh, you get your media, 
and you add uh, the agar, right? So the agar is like the gelatin or the pectin that you'd have in, in jello, and uh, you add the broth, so whatever the food source is. And then what you do is you, you boil it. Um, usually we stick it in autoclave. We'll talk about autoclaves a week after next. Uh, autoclave is, is kind of like boiling, uh, but you're adding pressure as well. And then you pour it into the dish, put the lid on, let it cool down, and then you have, um, then you have this stuff here. So um, I'm just going to pull the lid off the plate here. And uh, you probably know that uh, if you've ever made Jello, uh, it's pretty jiggly, right? And that's actually why we use agar. Agar is uh, it's a lot more firm. So you can see I'm touching with my finger here. My finger's not piercing. If I press really hard, it will, it will squish it and wreck it. Um, but that's why we use agar instead of something like pectin or, or, or something else. Um, but some people do use pectin uh, for certain organisms. But um, usually the, the thing of choice is agar. So put it in the Petri dish and you have an agar plate. So throw things up on the agar plate and uh, you can get a variety of different um, colonies. So what's a colony? You can imagine you have one bacterial cell and it doubles and doubles and doubles and doubles again, 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 and then you get a little colony. So in theory, each colony arose from one bacteria and, uh, and they're gonna be um, hopefully all the same species and, and genetically identical. Sometimes they kind of merge into one another. Uh, I found this in a textbook. It's actually a great plate because it has so many different species represented on there. I don't know how they did it. Uh, sometimes you can do that with soil. There's quite a variety of organisms in the soil, and you get, get a lot of different colonies. And some of these colonies uh, you might look at and, and have suspicions about what they might be. Like I'm looking at this here, and uh, I'm thinking that, uh, well, this was not even labeled. Um, that's probably a bacillus there. This could be Staphylococcus. Um, possibly Bacterium 2 could be E. coli. Kind of looks like it. It's hard to tell without seeing the actual plate. And then the real confirmation is doing the ground state. Uh, if you take a look at this here, here's a, a comparison between E. coli and bacillus, right? So when I see this on a Petri dish, it's usually pretty obvious that it's, uh, you know, it, it's either one or the other or, or could be one or the other. Like I said, there's quite a variety of different organisms out there. And, uh, you know, E. coli is always a little shinier. Uh, the colonies are, uh, are more round and raised and, you uh, uh, whereas bacillus, they're kind of flat, and if you look at the edge of the colonies, they're, they're not quite as well defined, right? So this is something that I've seen many times on a Petri dish. And then here's some cool ones I found on the internet. I don't even know what they are. I just thought I'd share them with you. But there's there are some interesting ones out there. Saw another one that looked a little, little, little bit like, uh, like fried eggs. I thought that was a cool one, too. I, I meant to throw this one on here. Uh, so I think I uh, going way back to um, topic uh, two, right? We were talking about classifying organisms and naming them, right? Remember we talked about Staphylococcus epidermidis because it lives on your skin, and Staphylococcus aureus has the name because what was aureus? Gold. It grows a golden yellowish color on a petri dish. So anytime you know I get a, I, I do a skin swab and you see a yellow, um, a yellowish colony. Uh, my suspicion is it's Staphylococcus aureus. So this one here is a lot more harmless than this one here. And we're going to talk a lot about Staphylococcus aureus in the next few weeks. Um, and uh, the stat is about a third, maybe a quarter of us have it on us naturally. And it's something that's transient, means it kind of comes and goes. So if I were to swab everybody here, uh, you know, probably I'd get about 10 plates with a little bit of Staphylococcus aureus on it. Um, it's not as... Um, not quite as abundant as Staphylococcus epidermis either. It likes a little bit more moisture. So if you can picture parts of your body that might have a little bit more moisture, like underneath your nose, right? We're breathing under here, your armpits, your belly button, you know, it, it likes the nooks and crannies just a little bit more because it likes a little bit more moisture than Staphylococcus epidermis. So like I said, we're gonna talk a lot about Staph aureus, uh, very, very important clinical organism uh, in, in many contexts. Uh, oh, there it is. There's the fried eggs. <laughs> uh, mycoplasma. Um, I'm not going to talk about mycoplasma this semester at all, but uh, other than to show you these cool colonies. And, um, you know, some people do art. <laughs> There's an entire website devoted to microbial art, by the way. Uh, this is not as easy as it looks. I was trying to do some, I, I, I'll have to share some pictures with you at some point of, uh, uh, that I tried to do some art. and, and uh, you know, just drawing something on a petri dish is really hard work. Never mind getting all the nice colors. Uh, and these are these are some that I found on that uh, that website. 
Okay, so what do we do with solid media? Uh, often it's used for something called streaking. Okay, so a word of wisdom for everybody here. You go to the internet, you go to Google Images, okay? When you go to Google Images, think about what you're typing in, okay? Uh, if you just type in streaking, <laughs> um, you're going to get the Super Bowl or something. <laughs> um, you got to type in bacterial streaking <laughs> if you want what you're looking for. You know, we don't want this, right? <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, it's happened to me a few times. Of course, you know, anytime you're looking for diseases, you're, you're going to get lots of weird things too, right? Uh, so what is streaking? Uh, streaking is where we have a sample, and this is standardly done with, um, with, with specimens, because uh, let's say uh, the back of somebody's throat has been swabbed, and uh, there could be multiple organisms there. So usually what they do is streak it out onto a plate to see if they get different organisms, and each one can be tested. So how does streaking work? Basically, the original specimen is taken, and um, it's spread or streaked into a section of the plate. And then you take the instrument, and uh, you sterilize it, and you do that again. So well, the idea here is you're, um, you're basically uh, uh, diluting the sample, and then that's done again and again, and diluting it again and again. So usually people do uh, uh, three or four streaks, and uh, your plate might look something like this, and hopefully each colony is a genetically distinct bacterium. Uh, I'll show you, I have a video here, and uh, it's very short, and this is somebody doing it. Let's play this. Maybe it's not gonna play. Let me see if I can load that up. Video unavailable, okay. Well, sorry about that. I actually made my own video and I forgot to put it up on here uh, as well. Um, but this just shows the streaking procedure. And like I said, this is a standard procedure done uh, in these diagnostic labs just to make sure you do have a, a pure specimen. And if you have multiple species, uh, then each of them might get their own gram stain to try to figure out what they are. So what about culture and viruses? Why would we ever want to culture viruses? Any thoughts on that? That's what we're going to get to in a second. Oh. Good question. Yeah. So why are we culturing viruses? Uh, usually not for diagnostic purposes, but you could, right? Um, usually uh, we culture viruses more for either study, scientific investigation. Um, or the other big one is uh, is producing vaccines, right? So uh, this is why the uh, messenger RNA vaccines uh, really took off. Uh, if you want to make a vaccine in the traditional method where you're growing up viruses, uh, that is um, that's not only a lot of work, but you're talking about having uh, all sorts of uh, you know safety protocols around virus production and all those kind of things, which can be which can be very risky, particularly when you're talking about a brand new virus. Um, with the messenger RNA vaccines, uh, you're just making RNA. And so you don't have to have uh, all sorts of biological safety uh, protocols there because the RNA itself is not infectious or anything like that. Um, but it is an important part of vaccine production is, is virus culture. So how do we culture viruses? This answers your question, is you have to do it inside uh, some sort of cell. So what is going on with my mouse here? But let's try that again. There we go. So how do we culture viruses? You have to have a cell culture of some sort, and then you can culture in the cells. And I'll show you some examples of how we might do that. So bacteriophage, remember those are viruses that infect uh, things like E. coli. Uh, so that's easy to do. You can grow up E. coli. I've done this uh, at least a few times, and uh, it's, it's very simple. You, you, spread, uh, you spread E. coli or whatever you're, you're, you're uh, culturing uh, across a Petri dish, we we'll call that a lawn. And then what you do is you pipette um, the virus culture in there. And uh, where the viruses grow, they kill the bacteria and perform and make these little things that we call plaques. And so you can see I have two different um, uh, photos there of plaques. So I don't, I don't know. Um, these are um, two different types of viruses. Some of them make big plaques. Some of them make small plaques. 
So you can stick your, um, your pipetter in there, right into the plaque, and you have lots of viruses in there. And you can do this with um, animal viruses as well. You can do these, these plaque growing type systems um, if you can culture the animal cells. And that's where it gets to be a little more difficult. Uh, so it turns out that culturing animal cells is a lot more, a lot uh, harder to do. And I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, one way we can do this, get around this though, is it turns out a certain number of viruses, we can um, either directly grow them or we can modify them to be grown in um, chicken eggs. So a chicken egg is basically a giant animal cell and it's got a bunch of food in there. And if you can modify that virus to do so, uh, then you can, you can grow it up there in and, and, and decent amount of quantities. Um, you can see there's a number of, uh, of viruses that can be grown. Uh, in these embryonated chicken eggs. So embryonated means that they've been fertilized. And uh, um, unfortunately, the problem with this, this is very slow. So this technology has been around since at least the 1940s, by the way. And, uh, and this is what we use for the flu vaccine. And it takes six months to make a flu vaccine because we're still growing it this way. Uh, it's kind of sad, really. We have a lot more modern methods for growing up flu viruses. But since this method is tried and true, um, we're not going to, nobody wants to spend a half a billion dollars to, uh, um, you know, go through all the, all the clinical trials and the testing to, to formulate a new flu vaccine that we could do a lot faster in six months, but it's tried and true. So what do we do for other types of viruses? Uh, we have to somehow grow animal cells and animal cells are a real pain in the butt to grow in the lab. They grow slowly. Often they only divide a few times and then they die. Um, they need special things. Like uh, most of your cells on your body are attached to something, right? Uh, and uh, you know, you're, you're attached to connective tissue and your connective tissue is attached to bones and so on. And this is the natural native way for animal cells to grow is um, they're in this uh, sort of harmony with other cells. And so animal cells, if they're not attached to something, one of two things happens. The cell dies, which is a good thing because if an unattached cell doesn't die, that's cancer, and that's a bad thing. So in order to grow animal cells, often what we do is we have ways to actually make them cancerous, and that makes them easier to grow in a, in a petri dish. And that's kind of what's shown here, is you've got the normal cells on the left and the, uh, the transformed ones on the right, and they grow a lot better in a culture. Uh, the most famous animal cells um, of all time for labs are these ones called HeLa cells. And so if you read the scientific literature, there are many, many things done in HeLa cells. Uh, if you go back uh, in, in history and of cell biology, uh, many of the things we've talked about, we've talked about DNA processes, we've talked about uh, um, uh, things like mitosis and meiosis. Uh, going back decades, were studied in HeLa cells because these things grow really well in a lab. And uh, so many vaccines, uh, the polio vaccine, for example, was not possible until HeLa cells were actually discovered. And so this is one way we do it. And they're not like infectious, like uh, um, this is really sad, but believe it or not, uh, experimenters in the 1960s wanted to find out whether if you got injected with HeLa cells, you'd get cancer and the answer is no. So they tested on, um, on convicts. <laughs> um, anyway, ethics aside, uh, so there's not a risk of people getting cancer from HeLa cells, it turns out. Uh, but the good news is we can grow up the viruses, which means we can get the vaccine. Um, another side note, HeLa cells have a very famous background to them. Uh, you can see uh, on the left, there's this book. Uh, and uh, the HeLa cells came from a woman. Her name was Henrietta Lacks. And so the, um, um, she had cervical cancer, and she died of it. Uh, as part of her, uh, um, you know, when they're looking at her cancer and whatnot, they took a biopsy. And the uh, physician who took the biopsy shared it with a scientist friend. And um, that was how the physician was coding his samples, right? So if your name was Bob Smith, then your sample would be labeled B-O-S-M, right? So um, anyway, these HeLa cells, they, they did all sorts of cool things for scientific uh, discovery. They, you know, we made the polio vaccine and all sorts of other things. And, and of course, people are like, HeLa cells, where do these things come from? These are amazing. Wow, wow, wow. And, uh, you know, they went back to the original source. And, uh, and he did something that is considered extremely unethical as he, he revealed the source, right? Um, you know, this is 
patient confidentiality stuff going on, right? Uh, we still take biopsies from people and they're still used for research, but they're they're never connected back to the source. You know, they're given a code, a barcode or something like that. Um, and there's there's serious confidential things going on here. Um, so so with this story, uh, you can you read about it in this book here, a very fascinating, very well written uh, nonfiction book about how, you know, like a decade later, they go back to interview the family. And this family was was um, uh, poor. Uh, they, they, they were, you can maybe notice that she's black. Uh, they were actually descended from, from slaves and they were a very, very poor family, um, uh, you know, just barely scraping by. And, and then these reporters start showing up and saying, you know, asking about her mom and how she's famous and her cells are doing all this stuff. And they're like, what is going on? You know, what are all these people doing? What's going on? And uh, so it's kind of a, a little bit about that, a little bit about the science. And it's, it's a great nonfiction read. And um, I guess apparently, um, Oprah did a movie with it on HBO. I haven't seen it yet. I don't know if anyone's seen it or not. Uh, at some point, I'll probably check it out. But um, anyway, very interesting um, nonfiction human story. Uh, OK, let me just do a time check here. I think we're doing, doing OK for time, aren't we? Yeah. OK, um, so one thing about all of this culturing and stuff uh, is worth mentioning is that everything has to be done aseptically. So what do I mean by aseptically? I mean it's done sterile. And I don't know why. Let me get rid of that up there. I'll just... Sorry, just playing around the computer screen. So what do I mean by by sterile? Um, it means and there, there's, there's methods for doing this. And this is the kind of thing you learn if you if you work in a lab in terms of how to do this. Uh, some of the obvious things are you know wearing gloves. You can see this person's wearing a mask and a, a head bonnet. Uh, that's not necessarily standard practice, but uh, this person is working in a, in a biological safety cabinet. And the way that thing is working is that the air is flowing in a certain way and the air gets filtered through a HEPA filter that takes away any pathogens and whatnot. And uh, uh, everything is sterilized. So you're not like, you're not touching the media with an unsterile instrument. And there's, there's two good reasons for this, right? Number one, we need to protect the people. Right, if this guy is working on some sort of dangerous pathogen, he doesn't want it to end up on his hands and take it home, uh, eat it with his lunch, right? Uh, the other thing is that we're trying to protect the specimens. Uh, you know, we have bacteria on our skin, we're breathing it out. Uh, you know, don't want the specimens to get contaminated by, you know, the, the, the lab work. And so, like I said, there's, there's methods for this uh, and uh, not worth going over all these uh, at the moment, but you know everything is sterilized. And we'll talk about sterilization uh, probably uh, next week or the week after. So I want to spend the last uh, few minutes kind of talking about um, uh, some different types of media and some types that you need to know. Okay, uh, there's a whole bunch of different types of media, and it's worth it kind of just touching a little bit on on each of them. We've already talked about this first type, which is um, kind of a general or a complex media where you're basically putting a whole bunch of nutrients in there and a lot of uh, a big variety of organisms will grow. So here's another one here. I showed you the trific broth. You can see there's a couple others here called nutrient agar, uh, triptych soy agar. So triptych soy agar, you probably know it's from soybeans, right? Soybeans, um, if you eat soybeans, you know they're a good source of protein and other nutrients. So uh, again, it's just, a, it's just a food source. Uh, and there's there's uh, one for this uh, nutrient agar it has a beef extract in there again a, a protein source right so these are non-selective encourage a, a variety of uh, organisms and uh, I'm just taking a look and see what I have here this one is TSC I can't remember what that stands for triptych something soy maybe I can't remember what the C stands for uh, but a, a variety of different methods of those or sorry a recipes. Uh, sometimes, and this is something that is used a bit more for scientists, uh, people use a minimal media. So minimal media is very precisely defined. And if you take a look on the left there, there's a precisely defined minimal media. And uh, you can tell exactly what's in it. So they have sodium bicarbonate, sodium sulfate, they have glucose starch, and so on. And this is usually done to study, uh, you know, very specific strains or genetic mutants and things like that. I think I've got a slide here. And you can see that uh, you know somebody's looking at some mutations in uh, Bacillus subtilis, right? And so you can see that uh, the wild type uh, grows on the minimal media. Uh, there's some sort of mutant, so it has a defect in one of its genes that does not grow on the minimal media. And this is a way to investigate and study that. 
Uh, so don't worry too much about minimal media, more for the scientists. What is important though in, in um, uh, clinical specimens is sometimes using various types of enriched medias. So what does enriched mean? It means you're adding something extra. So some of these pathogens, um, they, uh, uh, they, they, they're pathogens and they, they can only live on other organisms and they have to live in certain places. So if you take a look at this one, this is chocolate agar. I know, sounds exciting. Just in charge a little. Because what's in chocolate agar is basically blood that has been lysed. So the red blood cells have been broken open. And uh, so a lot of organisms, they need high iron, right? And, and they need uh, other nutrients that are found in blood. And so this is what the chocolate agar is. It's just uh, just uh, extra nutrients that are there for these organisms that require uh, that particular um, environment and that particular uh, set of nutrients. So enriched extra stuff, right? Uh, another type of media that's important a definition is selective. And uh, by the way, at the end of today, I'm going to show you two types of media that you need to know, McConkie agar and blood agar. But you do need to know what exactly they're doing. So this is why these definitions are important. So selective means that some organisms will grow and some will not. So I'll show you some examples of these. So if you take a look, there's a general media and you can see everything's growing on it. With the selective media, uh, only one organism is growing on it, right? So this is one way where you can have a sample and you just wanna test, okay, do we just have, uh, do we just have this particular organism um, and, um, and so you can exclude all others very easily by using the right kind of media. Uh, this is a media that I used to use, something called Pseudomonas isolation agar. So Pseudomonas is an organism uh, kind of uh, related to E. coli, and um, it's, it's very easy to get E. coli in there. So you can grow it on Pseudomonas isolation agar, and it actually includes a, a certain antibiotic that usually kills everything else, but doesn't kill Pseudomonas. It's a very easy way to do that. Um, we talked about the, the fungal organisms and the bacterial organisms. I guess I thought this slide was earlier. I mentioned that I was going to show you a slide of the fungi growing. Um, and I mentioned that, that fungal organisms prefer a lower pH, so an acidic pH, versus most bacterial organisms. And so this is the same sample that's been grown on two petri dishes. Uh, the one on the left is, uh, is at a neutral pH of 7, and the one on the right is more acidic at a pH of, of 6. And you can see that you get a very different profile of growth on both different plates uh, based on, on just uh, selecting things by, uh, by having different pH. All right, so one more definition is differential media. So differential means that they're gonna look different on the plate. So if you take a look, here's our general purpose. Everything kind of looks brown and creamy. If you look over here, some organisms grow uh, different colors. So a classical one that's used by scientists is something called Xgal. So Xgal, by the way, is, um, it's kind of like lactose. So lactose, you probably know, is a sugar in milk. And uh, a lot of organisms eat it because we eat milk, and then they like to eat the lactose that's in there in your gut, right? Uh, unless you're lactose intolerant, then you're not drinking any milk. But some organisms can consume lactose and some cannot. And so this x gal is actually uh, uh, kind of like lactose. It's a very similar structure, but it turns blue when uh, it's broken down. And so you can end up with blue colonies on there. Again, this is something that's used mostly by, uh, by scientists, not used in a, in a clinical lab. So what I do want to talk about is some specific types of, um, uh, of, of media use commonly in, in the clinic. Uh, although I wanted to show you this one here. This was the best picture I could find. Uh, we used to have this stuff. Um, and, and what I was, wanted to do was, and I, and I think what happened was we threw it out because it had expired. Uh, but I, I like to grow some up and show people because this is one of these things where the picture never, ever does any justice. And E. coli grows on this stuff. Um, so this is EMB media, which is, I can never remember the name, a soy and methyl and blue media. Um, and it grows this nice metallic green on there. And very cool stuff anyway. And it has to do with uh, lactose uh, um, uh, consumption as well. Okay, so media number one that you need to know is McConkey agar. Okay, this is named after some guy, McConkey. I don't know what his first name is, but we named the media after him. And so what does it have in there? Uh, so it has 
crystal violet. So crystal violet is the same stuff that is found in a gram stain and it's purple. Although on the plate, it never looks quite purple. It almost looks like a little bit more of a wine color, but it doesn't matter. It's purplish in color and they have uh, lactose in there and they have a, uh, a pH indicator. So you can see I'm calling on the slide a red, a, a, a red dye. Uh, so it's a pH indicator, right? And so what is going on here? So it turns out that the crystal violet actually inhibits gram positives. Remember gram positives have that thick cell wall and the crystal violet can get in there and it actually uh, inhibits the growth. So over on the left, we have normal media and you've got two organisms. You've got E. coli is gram negative and uh, Staphylococcus is gram positive and both organisms grow on that plate. On the McConkie agar, Staphylococcus is gram positive, does not grow. So McConkie agar is selective. So you're looking for a gram negative organism, this is the stuff to use. And because all the gram positives are going to die. Uh, so a very simple way to do that. It's not just selective though. It turns out that McConkie agar is also differential. So remember differential shows differences. And so it shows differences in terms of uh, lactose metabolism, right? So it has this uh, uh, pH indicator in there that is red at neutral and turns uh, yellow when things get acidic. So some organisms like salmonella, when they digest lactose, um, they, they make uh, an acidic byproduct. And so the acidic byproduct turns yellow and you end up with yellow colonies or yellow culture on the plate. And so very easy way to distinguish between salmonella and E. coli. Um, e. coli, usually not bad, sometimes bad. Salmonella, almost always bad, right? Um, you know, if it's found in, let's say, uh, it's found in ground beef. Like we find E. coli in ground beef all the time. It's, you can't get rid of it entirely. But if you find salmonella in ground beef, um, it's, it's got to be a recall. And that's how bad it is, right? Okay, McConkie agar is number one. What is the second one? The second one that you need to know is blood agar. So what is blood agar? It's just exactly how it sounds. There's blood in there. And just doing a time check here. Uh, so what do we do with the blood? Um, it's usually sheep blood. Um, I don't know whether sheep blood is cheap or free or just becomes a standard. Sometimes there are some pathogens that do actually require human blood. Um, but uh, for whatever reason, sheep blood is the standard. And uh, it's put into the agar. And so the agar looks red. And, uh, and so this is an enriched media because you're actually adding extra nutrients. Some pathogens require, um, require the blood. Uh, it's also differential. And I'll show you um, some examples of what it looks like when it's differential in that some organisms perform something that we call hemolysis. So hemo means hemoglobin or something like that. We're really talking about blood, blood cells. And lysis means breaking. So some of these organisms, as part of their pathogenesis, they actually break these things open. And, um, and as part of that breaking open process, uh, the, the, the agar doesn't look so red. It looks like this... Um, you know, this little uh, ghosty area, or uh, sometimes people call it a halo around the colony, right? And so you can see that very clearly on this plate. You can see the colonies and then the, uh, the zones of that, the halo-like zones around the colonies. So here's um, another plate. I found this one on, um, I think I found this one on Wikipedia. It was very nice. They, they showed all, all three types of hemolysis uh, on one plate. And uh, um, I'll get your question in a second. You can see we talk about alpha hemolysis, beta hemolysis, and gamma hemolysis. And uh, so what I want to do is um, I was going to make a flow chart. I'm just looking at the time. We're kind of running out of time. And what I'll do is just kind of as a, as a review, I'll do the flow chart next week and come back to this. I'll talk about it today and then I'll come back to it and talk about it. Questions? Is this the same thing with the chocolate egg? Not quite. In a chocolate agar, um, the, the uh, red blood cells are already broken open chemically, okay. right? And so you get the brownish color, but okay. kind of similar. These ones, the, the red blood cells are intact and the bacteria break them open. Oh. And that's why sometimes you get the halos. So let's talk about these differences here. Um, what is going on with these? And then these are often used to uh, distinguish between different types of streptococcus, by the way. Um, how many types of streptococcus are out there? I don't know. It's a huge list. You may have heard sometimes people talk about group A streptococcus 
and sometimes called GAS, G-A-S, is group B streptococcus. I think it goes all the way to H or K, or I, I don't even know. Um, and then you've got like streptococcus pneumonia, which isn't even in the groups, right? But this is actually one way to distinguish between different types of streptococcus. And so, for example, you can see that group A streptococcus um, does the beta hemolysis. So that's supposed to be a, B or, or a big beta. And so what is beta hemolysis? Beta hemolysis is complete hemolysis. I don't know why it got beta and not alpha. I have no idea. I didn't name them. Um, but beta hemolysis is complete hemolysis. So what is, what is um, um, group A strep? Uh, so group A strep uh, uh, includes streptococcus pyogenes. And like I said, what I'm going to do is do a little flow chart for you next week uh, as, as part of our review to come back to this. Uh, and streptococcus pyogenes causes uh, strep throat and blood infections and a whole bunch of other infections. It's actually the nastiest probably of all the streptococcus. Um, streptococcus pneumonia does alpha hemolysis. So what is alpha hemolysis? It's kind of a partial hemolysis. So you end up with, uh, often the colony is a little bit more green in color and um, you don't quite get the same kind of ghostly look around it, but there's a little bit of hemolysis going on, on it. Um, so streptococcus pneumonia, that's probably obvious what it causes, pneumonia. Um, the other group, the gamma hemolysis, there's, there's no hemolysis, right? Um, you don't get a little bit of the ghostly thing around that. We're not going to talk about the group A strep too much in this class, or the group B strep in this class too much. Um, the group D strep, by the way, has been renamed to Enterococcus. Uh, it's, it's an organism found in the gut and can cause some gastrointestinal symptoms, but uh, it's a good example of the group B uh, hemolysis. Uh, let me just see where we are with the time. I think we're, is that clock accurate? Uh, pretty much. Um, so I think uh, there are a few other things to, uh, to talk to you about, but let me just take a peek here. Yeah. I, I think what I'm going to do is finish off with this slide here uh, rather than getting anything new, but I want to show you this here. Uh, this is a company, uh, Hardy Diagnostics, and they specialize in actually making bacterial media. If you go to their website, you can see they have like thousands of products. But one of the things I found, which I thought was pretty cool, were these plates here. Um, I can't see what it's called because I can't read the top of that, but uh, there's these plates for testing urine samples. And so it turns out that whatever they have in the media, and, and maybe you can see down the middle of the plate, there's a bit of a divider, that on, on this side of the plate, only gram negatives grow. On this side of the plate, only gram positives grow. And then they have colorized indicators in there so they can actually tell you what organisms are found in the urine sample. So you can see, for example, E. coli grows in rose. And on the left, you can see that Enterococcus is teal, Staphylococcus epidermis is white, and so on. So I thought that one was kind of cool because it, uh, they're, they're really trying to do a lot all in, in one plate, uh, which is often a very useful thing to have. Okay, so we are um, um, pretty much out of time. Uh, so uh, my plan is to have the midterms back to you on, um, on Tuesday, okay? Um, I will try to get the grades up today, at least. You can see your grade. I know some people are, are concerned about that. And, um, and we'll take them up on Tuesday. Um, long weekend. So that's exciting. Right? I don't know how busy you are. I think everybody's busy from here. Anyway, my plan is to um, continue with the high tax for at least a couple of weeks um, and to kind of go from there, um, just waiting to see what's going on with the government and the college and all those kind of things. Um, but ultimately, the plan is for midterm number two to be on paper, okay? So uh, whatever your plans are, do try to be here in person for midterm number two, okay? Anyway, thanks for coming. I will see everybody next week.